So our first speaker in this last session of the conference um, is Ori Fox from Space Telescope, and he's going to be talking about a proposed extended time domain survey. All right, everyone can see. Okay, thank you. So yeah, I'm very excited to be here today to tell you a little bit about a recent white paper that our team submitted uh, as a response to the call for the early definition survey. This is called the Extended Time Domain Survey, and it's very relevant for the conference this week on time domain astronomy with Roman. So of course, I'd be remiss not to thank all of our collaborators. We had a lot of teammates from around the world, um, but especially here at the Institute, You've seen this logo before. We're your growing group, Transient Science at Space Telescope, TSST, uh, and a number of speakers uh, during the conference this week. Suvi is a part of it as well. Uh, before we begin, I just want to give a brief history about this project. The concept of finding high redshift supernovae is not entirely new. It's been around for quite some time. Uh, it's certainly not my idea, but for the first time, we can actually do it. Um, and a lot of the ideas sort of came to a head this past year during the JWST cycle one call for proposals. Uh, we tried to, uh, being at the Institute, we tried to figure out a way to do this with uh, the web, uh, led by Armin Rest and Louis Strolger. That proposal did not succeed. However, out of the ashes was born this idea, and I led the path forward with this particular white paper. At about the same time, I just want to highlight that Takashi and Robert and Brant were writing a peer review version of this idea. Uh, Takashi presented that earlier this week, focused specifically at discovering high redshift supernovae during the epoch of reionization. And uh, that got put up on the archive right about the time we were writing the white paper. And a lot of those ideas and simulations got integrated into our proposal or our white paper uh, and the three authors joined us as well. So uh, we have a slightly different take on this because we are trying for, to convince, you know, uh, to start some of the surveys early uh, and this part of the early definition. So it's a slightly different angle, but our ideas are in fact starting to converge. So right off the bat, here's what it looks like. Here are the properties compared to other large scale wide field uh, space telescope surveys, including the Roman high latitude time domain survey on the top, Cosmos Web right below it, uh, and then some of the HST surveys. Um, right off the bat, it's important to point out, we call this the extended time domain survey because we're hoping that it extends the currently planned high latitude time domain survey in uh, wavelength out to F213. Uh, Takashi made that uh, very clear. Uh, out in redshift reach, uh, supernovae out to about redshift of eight. Uh, we have a large uh, square five square degree field and also extended in time scale from about two to four years. And we'll show you the reasons for, for doing this in just a few slides. But the bottom line is it creates this unprecedented survey unmatched in the total combination of all of these parameters. So some of the science drivers we've heard about a little bit this week. One are these uh, really rare, we can use the word exotic transients at very high redshifts that we think come from the very first stars. These pop three stars, very low metallicity, um, therefore uh, 150, 250 solar masses. And uh, we expect these rare events like pair instability and superluminous supernovae. The details of the explosion physics and the observational parameters are still a little bit murky. Uh, one of our postdocs in the group, Sebastian Gomez, uh, detected one of potentially two current cases of a pair instability supernova event. There's still a lot to learn. We really don't know much about these, uh, and we need to build up these samples. I mean, this is sort of your New York Times front page story, the explosion of the first stars, right? But they're very rare. We can't design a whole space-based survey around you know, a couple rare events, no matter how exciting they are. And so there is a lot of other exciting science that really is driving such a proposal. 
We've talked a little bit about the high mass, initial mass function, IMF, and transients during the epoch of reionization. What sorts of, uh, what are the sources of the epoch of reionization? We think here, uh, you can see on the left, is an evolving IMF uh, based off of theory, what, it, what the IMF light might look like changing as a function of redshift, becoming more and more top heavy. To really probe that, that end of the IMF, you need to look for the explosions of some of the most massive stars. And highlighted here is uh, just to, to point out that you know when you're talking about stars over 50, 100 solar masses, you really need to start looking and building up your sample of superluminous and parent stability events. These things are rare to distinguish between different IMF scenarios uh, shown here on the right are the number of high mass supernovae expected per year per degree as a function of redshift and the cumulative function as well. The uh, explosion function really peaks between about two and four in redshift, but uh, if, you, uh, if you really want to distinguish between all the different IMF scenarios at a statistically significant level, you really need a wide field of view and to go pretty deep. Ultimately, such a sample can resolve open questions to understanding the impact of massive stars on reionization, the buildup of galaxies, and all other sorts of aspects of stellar and galaxy evolution. But wait, there's more ancillary science. We really should have called it ancillary because this is also a really strong driver for such a survey. By going deep and out to uh, longer wavelengths, you're able to extend low Z time domain science out to high Z where time dilation effects dominate. That includes things like AGN reverberation mapping uh, to measure black hole masses at redshift of six. Large supernova sample can extend cord collapse supernova rate studies beyond anything we currently have possible, maybe even detect the highest Z1A ever. Uh, and then more nearby, we've heard a few talks about various subjects in the IR, dust obscured and nuclear supernovae, IR bright transients that have sort of been discovered by these sprites and uh, inter intermediate luminous infrared transients uh, by spirits, long-term monitoring of long duration transients like CSM interaction, these two ends, 1A CSMs, one example is this O5IP that's still bright after nearly 20 years. And for all the non-transient people that might be on this call, there's stuff for you too. Uh, ultra deep, uh, wide field, five square degree field that approaches Cosmos Web, at least at the uh, shorter wavelength filters. So a lot of great static science as well. Takashi showed this plot, but it's worth going over again, especially in the context of what I just said. These are color magnitude diagrams that highlight the phase space for different types of supernovae, such as 1As, type 2s, superluminous and parent stability events. Overplotted are a few things. Uh, first are color tracks uh, for different redshifts, ranging from one and a half to about uh, three for the type 1A uh, model, and also a Z equals six to 10 for uh, one of the superluminous events at 17 G EGM. Um, also overplotted are our proposed depths uh, for uh, a reasonable uh, integration times. And as Takashi pointed out, to really do this and separate the parent stability from the superluminous events, you have to go out to F213 in color space, especially when you are considering reddening vectors. At these high redshifts, you have more uh, dust, uh, especially in star-forming galaxies. On top of that, you want to go deep. Uh, because at least for us, we want a detection in both filters. That, able, that first of all enables us to confirm that it's a real event, but also uh, gives us uh, temperature information. And if you want to track that over the entire lifetime of the supernova so that you can potentially really characterize it and understand its properties and not just say you saw something that lands in this particular region of phase space. Speaking of light curve, that is important to point out as well. Uh, the Takashi showed this figure that shows the parent stability supernova light curve, which are the solid lines for various filters, does extend for a long time, especially when you take into account time, time dilation, like five, six, seven years. So to, co to cover an entire light curve of one of these events, you have to go deep, okay, that's first of all. But second of all, you have to start early, and that's really one of the primary drivers for this uh, early uh, definition survey. 
Um, if we have an only a guaranteed lifetime for enrollment of five years and a, a high latitude starts at just over two years, you really need to start this early on at about zero years. Uh, there are other advantages to starting such a survey early. Uh, you provide this DEEP 158 template uh, for the high latitude time domain survey. Uh, F213 buys you some photos of host galaxies. And also you're able to filter out these quote unquote contaminating transients such as AGN and variable stars. Here are what the rates look like. These come from Takashi simulations. Uh, we designed the survey to be able to detect a, you know, a handful of superluminous events. You can see we're at about the dozen level, just a couple past redshift of six. That buys you a few more parent stability events, which is pretty nice. So that gives you a nice sample right off the bat. And then core collapse, you could just get blown out of the water. You're talking tens of thousands out at the epic of reionization. I mean, it's just really exciting. The survey itself has 18 pointings, five square degrees, four epics spaced over two years every six months. Uh, you need about two and a half hours of integration per filter, totaling about 90 hours per epic or 360 hours total. You also get uh, your, your individual exposures or in epics, I guess you could say, would consist of shorter integrations spaced over a month to optimize low, low Z sampling and faster evolving transients. And your choice of field is flexible, but we recommend the high latitude time domain survey for pretty obvious reasons. So in conclusion, I really wanna read these points because it is so important. Roman's wide field of view and near IR sensitivity are the only route for probing these uh, uh, stellar populations at high Z and to find intrinsically rare explosions. Uh, ETDS is not just an extension of low Z studies, but it probes pop three stars and the epic of reionization. A statistically significant sample of these massive star explosions uniquely trace the evolution of the high mass end of the IMF. And the high latitude time domain survey does provide powerful capabilities to detect such transients, but you need the ETDS to provide the time scale and the wavelength coverage to definitively uh, identify some of these uh, rare transients. It will produce an unparalleled database um, and an exceptionally deep, wide and, uh, deep and wide imaging compared to Cosmos Web, but eight times larger. And so all of this can be yours and more for only 360 hours, which is just a small fraction of the entire um, high latitude time domain survey. So I'll end it there and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Ori. Hopefully some, of the, some people in the audience will be on the Roman tech at some point. Um, are there any questions? You can put them in the Slack or in the chat. While people are thinking, I will ask, um, since these are slow and rare transients, um, I understand that you're piggybacking on the high latitude time domain survey, but what if you went bold and thought of a bigger program that was much wider? Because um, again, you know, the high latitude time domain survey is gonna be overkill with cadence um, because they're, doing this type 1a supernovae, but how ambitious could you get in a dedicated, much wider, um, slow time domain survey? Yeah, that's a, a great question. So if you assume that th these are your rates over two years uh, for five square degrees, and let's say that costs you 360 hours, so you double that, um, and so you get 10, so maybe, I don't know, I guess, you know, like Sebastian was talking, maybe 15 square degrees, right? So let's say for a thousand hours, you can get 15 square degrees over two years. Um, you would essentially triple these rates, right? Uh, which is pretty nice, depending on what your ultimate science goals are. But the key thing is, is that you lose the time coverage. So if you want, and, and at these high redshifts, you do have a lot of time dilation. And so time coverage is almost just as important as, you know, field of view, I think. I guess you could debate that. 
So I guess there's, you know, as, as usual, a lot of trade-offs. Um, and so if somebody made a case that you needed 36 superluminous events versus 14, uh, to do some of the studies that, you know, we discussed up above IMF or just getting, you know, to constraining the physics, uh, then you would need to triple this. If somebody said you need the light curve, the entire light curve, um, and you didn't want to piggyback off of high latitude, you could triple it in time and cover six years, right? Something like that. So Ryan Foley, who's our next speaker, has a question for you. If you have any thoughts about combining this survey with your JWST survey idea, so piggybacking across um, telescope missions. Yeah, 100%. I mean, J everyone knows JWST is not a survey telescope, right? Um, we were trying to beat Roman to the punch. It's not, I mean, at the TAC knew it, everyone knew it, but we, we, we wanted to do it. Uh, so it's really a follow-up machine, right? So sure, there's a huge amount of synergy. Get the spectra, get the, you know, uh, whatever you need. So for sure, if Roman can get this thing launched faster and uh, well, now we have 20 years, right? So maybe some good job security. So uh, I guess there's not as much of a rush anymore. I guess, is, is sort of what you're getting at, Ryan. So of course. Great, thanks, Ori. Um, 